I should know this by heart by now, Dennis, not the long version, just the short version. If you want to look up the very long bio of Dennis and all the um, probably 100 articles that he's written, you can go on the York University website and there's just reams and reams of stuff. But for today, Dennis Pilon is a professor at York University and one of Canada's preeminent experts on voting system reform. He has written numerous journal articles, newspaper articles, book chapters, and books, including The Politics of Voting, Reforming Canada's Electoral System, and Wrestling with Democracy, Voting Systems as Politics in 20th Century West. And today we've asked Dennis to talk to us about some of the most important lessons that the electoral reform movement in Canada has learned in the past couple of decades, and also to give us some reasons for hope, uh, which are really important to those of us who have been uh, in the trenches of this for quite a while. So I'll turn this over to Dennis. Thank you, Dennis. All right. Well, thank you, Anita. And, you know, thanks to everyone for coming out tonight. Wow. I mean, almost 350 people uh, signing up on a, on a Sunday night uh, to talk about this topic. I mean, if nothing else gives me hope, uh, it's that so many of you have been involved in this topic and you've given your time and your energy. Uh, and really, you know, we wouldn't have made any of the gains that we have if it hadn't been for people like yourselves. And I know that some of you are, are just starting out. Uh, maybe this is your first time coming to one of these events, but I, I noticed on the list of the names coming through some real um, warriors in the trenches uh, of our movement. So thanks for sticking with this topic and, uh, and taking it out into the streets uh, amongst your neighbors and friends, uh, you know, getting us on the agenda. I want to share my screen. I've got a very short little presentation I want to do, and then we'll open things up so that people can... Um, uh, let me just, uh, I always have to, this, this, there we go, play from start. Let's see if this works. There we go. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, I'll, I'll chat and I'll, I'll give you my 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 take uh, and then we'll, then we'll have a back and forth. And that's where I really want you to drive the content of our time together. Uh, you know, we've got this theme, but if there's other things that you want to talk about or, you know, things you want to be reminded of, you want to go back to some basics, I'm happy to do whatever you want to do in the time that we have together tonight. Okay, well, let's add things up since 2000, because that was the brief I was handed. And I know sometimes it might look like I have a large beer with me tonight. You know, I've, our state of, of, of play is driving me to drink, but not so. It's actually ginger ale. Um, I, I really think that, you know, we've got, um, we've got a time to assess where we are at. This is a, as good a time as any. Uh, and so let's add up where we are, where we have come in the last uh, 20 years. And so just you know, off, off, off the back of an envelope, I put down the various things that, you know, we've run through. And we've had two citizens assemblies, uh, BC and Ontario, uh, both wildly successful, uh, really amazing examples of people with resources able to really come up with fantastic ideas. We've had, roughly speaking, 10 legislative efforts around the topic. Um, so we've had two at the national level. We've had let me just see my little thing is in the way here. Um, we've had two in uh, Prince Edward Island. Uh, we've had uh, two in New Brunswick, three in Quebec, and one in Yukon. And I'm kind of using this fairly broadly um, to uh, include uh, any effort by a government, uh, you know, whether they set up a commission, uh, whether they have a committee of, of the legislature like they did in Yukon, you know, looking at the question. So 10 different uh, efforts that were primarily running out of the legislature or delegated from the legislature, but but not as a citizen's assembly. We've had seven referenda on the question <laughs> at the provincial level. So uh, three in British Columbia, three in Prince Edward Island, and of course, one in Ontario. And we've had a number of multi-party agreements to move the issue forward. We had a situation in British Columbia where the Greens and the BC NDP worked together to um, have another referendum on the question when they were uh, helping each other remain in power in 2018. Uh, and we had a multi-party agreement in Quebec that we thought was going to actually bring a change. Uh, a a multi-party agreement, everyone but the government had agreed that if they got into power, they would introduce a new voting system. Unfortunately, when one of the parties came to power, it backed out of its commitment. So we've seen an awful lot of activity over the last two and a half decades. But nevertheless, if we look at the bottom line, you know, zero adoptions of PR, uh, which obviously has got, you know, got to be disappointing. Let's see my thing here. There we go. So does that make us failures? Uh, are we failures? Do we walk away from this saying it was all for naught? Uh, you know, we didn't get what we wanted, so we didn't have any impact. Well, as I said, I think this is definitely a time for us to assess, 
where we are at as a, as a movement, uh, as a group of people who've been agitating uh, on this question. And I, I think that we have to have a benchmark. We've got to have something to compare ourselves to. Uh, we can't just look at ourselves and, and say, well, we could have done more. We could have hit the streets longer. We could have talked to more people. We could have contracted more politicians. Um, I think we need some measure of what people have been able to do in other countries, particularly those countries where they've succeeded, to try to say, well, what have we done? How does it measure up? Uh, is what we have done remarkably different than other countries? And at the same time, I think we need to compare where we're at today with where we have been. Where were we 30 years ago? Where were we 20 years ago? Where were we 10 years ago? You know, when I started on this topic over 30 years ago and appeared before the Royal Commission on Electoral Reform and Party Financing, presenting my model for a proportional voting system for Canada, they thought PR was public relations. Um, you know, these were political animals. They'd been appointed by a government to head up a Royal Commission, but they had no idea, not the, not the foggiest, what PR stood for. Today, you won't find many who are in the political elites who don't know what PR is. So even just at that measure, things have, have changed a lot since I got started on this topic uh, three decades ago. What's happened in other countries? How can we compare ourselves to what they've accomplished elsewhere? And here, I just want to underline something that you may not be aware of, which is that voting system reform everywhere has been slow, except when it hasn't. Um, and so what I mean by that is, you know, when you look at the long durée, uh, most cases, there has been a very, very long process of advocacy, of mobilization, of agitation for a new voting system. Uh, and so let's look just at Germany, right? Germany, uh, you know, comes together as a, as a nation state in 1870, and pretty much right away, there's, there's agitation to change the voting system. Uh, and so that agitation just continues, but they don't actually adopt a proportional system until 1919. So a very long period of, of gestation over, over the topic. And, and they're not an exception. They're not an outlier. Most Western European countries see a very long period of advocacy and tussle over the voting system, um, uh, before, particularly before World War I. And even the most recent era of reform, you know, we, we had a long period where there wasn't really anything happening on voting system reform from the late 50s into the 1970s. And then suddenly the topic relaunches again. And we see everyone talking about it in these different countries. Um, but again, uh, the fact that people were noticing the voting system didn't mean that there were any immediate changes. And in the countries that we're most familiar with, Italy, Japan, New Zealand, decades. It took decades to move those countries from their existing voting systems to a new voting system. So it really, it really is a good measure of our success or lack thereof um, by looking at what's happened in other countries. It's too easy to say, New Zealand, wow, what a poster child for voting system reform, but it didn't happen overnight there. It didn't happen overnight. It took a long time and a lot of work and a lot of random luck was involved in making that change as I'll, I'll go into in a moment. What about when voting system reform happens quickly? Um, well, we did see a fairly rapid adoption of proportional voting systems in particular historical moments. Uh, so after World War I and in the re-adoption of proportional voting systems after World War II in Western Europe, you saw quite dramatic changes. I mean, an entire continent just swept across. I mean, it, it's not often that you see different countries simultaneously making a change, the same change. Uh, there's something going on when that happens. Uh, and so that is something that is out of the ordinary unusual that, again, we have to factor into our, our understanding. Um, and as I say, we've got lots of examples that we can choose from in both cases, cases where there's a long process, cases where there's a short process. One of my favorite examples, and by favorite, I mean I hate it, um, is the alternative vote adoption in British Columbia in 1951. This one happened, wow, super fast. Super fast. The government was a coalition of two uh, parties, one a right wing party, another a center right party. And when the coalition fell apart, they immediately introduced this new voting system practically overnight. Um, and so when elites want change, they can act very quickly. Um, when they don't want change, they can stall, they can drag their feet, they can push things off into committees. Um, another really, uh, I think, telling example was the 
flip-flop in France, which adopted a proportional voting system in 1983, uh, and then took that back out again in 1985. And both happened with very little consultation, very little public input, very much at the behest of the parties uh, that were in power. So why do we see these patterns? Why, why uh, if we look at the total number of voting system reform episodes, why do we see these strong patterns? Uh, for the most part, uh, fairly slow processes, if any, reform, uh, or quite quick uh, processes happening uh, in particular historical moments. Uh, what, what is pushing this? Well, I think here, uh, you know, the short answer is power. You know, one view of politics says that, you know, politics is kind of a reflection of what the people want. Um, you know, the the voting system is an adding machine that just adds up what people want and then reflects it into government. But this is a rather naive view. Uh, another view says that politics is all about power and power is not shared equally. Um, and in a political environment, unequal power then reflects in unequal um, government. Um, and so because the government and the state make laws, uh, they hand out contracts that are worth millions of dollars, billions of dollars, um, a lot's at stake for very powerful people in our society. So even though parties obviously in some sense answer to voters, I mean, voters vote and that's how parties get into office, how they get into legislatures and gain power, but it's naive to assume that the voters are in the driver's seat. Uh, obviously, the, the funders who fund the political parties, who influence the party elites, they clearly have significant influence over uh, what these parties do, often to the detriment of what the public interest may be. And we can see this impact of power on the patterns of reform that I've been mentioning. Uh, things that start with elite interest uh, are different than those that start with public pressure. Sometimes both are there. Uh, certainly um, around World War I in Winnipeg, there was a, a huge Winnipeg general strike that followed uh, World War I. Uh, and there was an interesting um, uh, interplay between elite interests and public pressure going on there. But some of the examples I've talked about were strictly elite interest. So the case of British Columbia in 1951, where uh, the coalition government of the day uh, just suddenly introduced uh, a majoritarian voting system, uh, that clearly started with elite interest. Uh, there wasn't any other talk going on. Um, on the other hand, public pressure can lead to reform, no doubt about it. We've seen examples where public pressure was a key ingredient in the reform process. And if we look at Canadian history, clearly public pressure was important in leading to the adoption of voting system reforms in 19 municipalities across Western Canada uh, shortly after, after World War I. But this pattern of reform, uh, it, you know, as I've mentioned, can go fast or go slow. And so what we've seen in tracking this as social scientists is that elite interest tends to go fast um, and uh, public pressure tends to go slow. Um, again, these are, these are tendencies. Uh, you can always find maybe some examples that stand out that don't follow this, but for the most part, they do. Um, and so in the latter, we often see that despite considerable public pressure, the latter can be delayed and deflected into consultation and redirection. Uh, so um, governments that don't want to act, parties that don't want to accept the policy, uh, politicians who don't want to take up the issue, they can find ways to delay and deflect uh, public pressure. Not forever, um, but as long as they think it may last. Sometimes they can outlast uh, the public pressure. And some of the ways they do this, of course, I mean, the most obvious one is to just ignore uh, the pressure, uh, or they can condemn it. And we saw that as the initial response of most of the political actors in the media was to, you know, try to ridicule the issue. First, they ignore it, then they ridicule it, um, then they start responding in all sorts of ways that, you know, don't reflect a, a fair engagement with the issue. Um, when we get past that, and I would argue that those are the steps we've gone through, right? From the start of Fair Vote Canada in, in 2000, we have seen us march through these various steps where we're ignored, uh, then we're ridiculed, uh, then, our, 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 then they engage, but not in a, in a, in a fair way. Um, and we have moved through each of those, each of those stages. And so once we get past a certain point, then they have to start ponying up something. Uh, but it's usually not what we want. Uh, and Or it's not directly what we want. Obviously, what we want is just change, change the system to a more fair one. Um, 
So then they offer us consultation or they try to redirect our efforts to other venues. And here we can see in the Canadian patterns of delay and deflection over the last two decades, obviously commissions of various kinds. You know, the government's got a problem, people are unhappy, let's ship it out to a royal commission or a commission of some kind or a legislative committee. And hey, we're talking. And as long as we're talking, we're not doing. Um, and the hope is that by the time um, pressure might mount to do something, uh, Something may have happened. Maybe there's an election. Uh, maybe the minority government has been turned into a majority government. Maybe the government's been defeated and the opposition is now in power and they don't care about the issue. So these are all ways in which um, public pressure can be uh, delayed or deflected into other, other areas. Um, obviously, public engagement we saw with the CAs. As good as the citizens' assemblies were, I mean, when we look at the rationale, the the intent of the governments that sponsored them, it was pretty clear that they didn't intend those to actually produce anything uh, or lead to change. And, and there's some very easy ways for us to know that. I mean, when push came to shove, they didn't spend any money uh, to let anybody know that these commissions had done anything. Um, and they, they introduced the commissions uh, with a host of rules that were meant to undermine their impact and make it very difficult for the public to take up the reforms that the uh, different citizens' assemblies have put forward. The other uh, technique that we often see is to try to push reform to other levels of government. Uh, it's not uncommon to see politicians at one level say, ah, well, I'll let these people at the junior level uh, take up this uh, take up this issue. It certainly was the case historically. Uh, if you look at the voting system reform history uh, that I've done on Canada, what you saw was that you know various activists were trying to get the federal and provincial government to change the voting system around World War One, and the response of politicians was to say, "Well, why don't you go to the municipal level?" Uh, and so we saw in, in, in provinces like British Columbia, governments pass enabling legislation so that actors would focus their energies on the municipal level where there weren't parties. And so then they could, you know, basically spin their wheels. I mean, they were successful for a time at that level. Interestingly, of course, more recently, we saw that activists who were unsuccessful at getting parties to commit at the provincial level, then were essentially forced to take local uh, efforts as a as a as an alternative. Um, we saw how long that lasted. Uh, so uh, an Ontario Liberal government, you know, allows people to make the reform at the civic level, but a conservative government just comes in and takes it away. So much for referendums, right? We, we heard conservatives are, are terribly committed to referendums. Gosh, we can't do anything without them. The people must speak, except when we don't need them to speak. Uh, and so Doug Ford was able to just take away those reforms without any public consultation whatsoever. So you can see here a pattern of behavior across all of these, uh, all of these efforts. So what has changed in the 20 years? I mean, at one level, we haven't seen an adoption of a proportional voting system, which is the goal of Fair Vote Canada, and, and obviously many of you who've tuned in tonight. And that is harsh. You know, we, we all thought that we would get there. We wanted to get there. Uh, Fair Vote Canada, I think, was rather um, uh, overzealous, uh, perhaps over-optimistic. Uh, I remember having a meeting with Larry Gordon talking about these historical trends and him telling me, well, 20 years, come on, by that time, you know, we're going to be there. We're not there. Um, and so in that sense, uh, it, it is it is frustrating and it is time to take stock of, of what we have learned, uh, what has happened. Well, certainly what has changed in the last two decades is the elite visibility of the issue. Um, if you're involved in politics beyond just voting, um, you know this issue, you know about it, uh, and you know where you stand. Uh, you're for it, you're again it, uh, you know, you're, 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 there's very few people who aren't somewhere on the spectrum of what they think on the issue, and that is a change. You know, when I was at active in different political parties, when I was taking this to public meetings, I had to start by explaining what a voting system was to people, because they had no idea, right? To them, voting with single-member plurality was the only way to vote. How else could you do it? This is crazy. Why are we having this conversation? Um, they, they had no idea that there were other choices that could be made because they didn't have any experience. And the people who did know were often people who came from other countries, right? People who had immigrated from Holland or Germany or Sweden. They knew that there were other ways to vote. But Canadians that had been in the country and only voted in Canada really had, had, had not. And these were politically active people didn't know anything. So we have seen a profound shift in the elite visibility of this issue, which obviously moves the depth of the discussion uh, in, a, in a significant way. We have also improved the public knowledge 
of the issue. It's certainly less than the elites. Um, the public generally is not well versed on any aspects of our elections. Um, and hey, I'm not I'm not throwing shade on the public. Uh, they're busy. They're, they've got lives. Uh, unlike you and me, who like to spend a Sunday night talking about this topic, uh, most of them are doing something else. Um, and they come to an election once every four years or however many different elections they've got going, and they look to others to say, you know, how does the system work? So we haven't been as successful at ramping up general public knowledge, but no one has. Uh, Elections Canada, the political parties, I mean, the public has got a lot on their plate, of which voting in an election is just one thing that shows up every now and then. Um, we have also built up the activist capacities and knowledge. You know, when we started, people struggled to answer some of the um, jerk uh, responses that we get. There's really no nice way to talk about it, right? When you're at a meeting and you're trying to raise an issue about democracy and somebody says, well, Nazi Germany had proportional representation, you know, you want to throw up your hands. You know, you, you, you want to say, really, you're going there? I mean, but those were the kinds of things that people needed to figure out. People needed to figure out, well, what's the good response to this local representation issue, majority government, extremism, all the usual accusations that would flow. Now we've got an activist cadre who really have built up their capacity and knowledge about how to move a conversation past those, you know, into things that will bring in the uncommitted. Sure, the political elites who are trying to, you know, end the conversation will throw out all this stuff. But the capacities that we've built up as an organization and as a group of activists now allows people, I think, to get to the public uh, more quickly and even reach some of the elites uh, more readily. We've also put together a, a huge body of, of expert resources. Uh, you know, at our fingertips now, we have details, we have facts uh, that can be mobilized and marshaled and wielded, uh, you know, in public debate, in letters to the editor, uh, you know, in, in all sorts of settings. And here I want to stop and use, you know, I'm going to put on my academic hat here for a moment, um, because I think this point is a really important one. The hegemonic position of SMP or single member plurality, the voting system that we use, has in the past 20 years been effectively challenged. Now, hegemony is one of those, you know, words, you know, it's like a hundred dollar word. It was like, what the hell does that mean? Um, it, interestingly, it was invented by a, you know, working class political activist, spent a lot of his life in jail. Uh, you know, he was no academic. Um, but this idea of hegemony is really important because here's the thing, here's what you need to know about hegemony if you don't know it already, and I don't assume that you don't, but you know, if you don't, hegemonic ideas aren't just popular ideas. They're not ideas that are, are, are you know, the leading ones. Hegemonic ideas are ideas that are so out there that nobody questions them. They don't require any evidence to sustain them. People just accept when people say them. And so a hegemonic idea is a hard one to challenge because nobody's asking for an explanation. Nobody expects there to be an explanation or a rationalization for a hegemonic idea. It's just accepted. And that's really tough. It's tough for activists to come in and get people talking about a hegemonic idea because everybody's like, why are we talking about this? So the work that you have done um, over the last two decades um, is that you have challenged the hegemonic position of this voting system in a way that it is not as accepted. It, it, it cannot get the free ride that it generally got um, when we started. Uh, certainly when I started and when Fair Vote Canada got started in 2000, um, it is a very different world. And that creates a different game space for us in terms of moving uh, this issue forward. All right, well, what have we learned? I think that we can draw out some lessons from our time. Um, one is that educating the public is hard. I don't think that um, a lot of people reckoned with that. You know, we 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 thought that um, it was a no brainer. Uh, make every vote count. Who can be against that? I'm sure that once we explain this, everyone will rush into our arms. And that didn't occur. Uh, and then people thought, well, thank goodness the internet's arrived because the internet and social media are going to make it so easy for us to connect with people and communicate with people and get our message out. And that hasn't proven to be the truth either. I mean, obviously, social media has given us some opportunities for organizing. It allows us to do these webinars. Um, but hey, people who don't like what we're doing, 
also have the internet, also have social media. And so, uh, you know, it hasn't proven to be an advantage uh, over the others necessarily. Uh, it's just another way of, of doing our work. I think we've learned that organization is about resources. Uh, you, you need money, uh, you need people, you need time. Time uh, is just another way of talking about uh, money and people. Because to do the work that we do, we need some people to not watch, you know, whatever is the top TV show and instead do this work. Uh, we need people who can take time out from something else that maybe they need to do. Um, meanwhile, the rest of the political world is drawing on resources from all sorts of places, uh, which are designed to get results, right? You know, corporations that give money uh, to politicians expect to get something for it. Um, you know, they're not just doing it for the good of their health. Um, and, you know, I, I remember my old local politics professor, you know, once said that local politics is a cost to citizens, but it's business to developers. Um, and they write off those costs. Uh, and so they're on the phone every day, you know, to City Hall to get what they want. Uh, the citizen, on the other hand, has to work. Uh, and then they come home and then they get on the phone to City Hall. Uh, so it's really a, a, a challenging thing uh, to organize ourselves. Um, you know, it, it requires money. It requires people. I think we've discovered that fighting public campaigns like referendums is a lot harder than we had thought when Fair Vote Canada got started in in uh, in 2000. People looked at what happened in New Zealand and they thought, bing, bang, bong, we're going to get a referendum. The people are going to speak and we'll be on our way. And that's not what happened. Um, and so I think people are, 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 are better equipped uh, to understand some of those challenges. I think we've learned that the traditional parties, and here I'm thinking particularly of conservatives and, um, and liberals, but also some of the third parties that are more on the center right, they oppose our issue, I think for obvious reasons, it cuts into their total control of the political system. But that doesn't mean that all their politicians do. Uh, I think we've learned that sometimes we can get through to their politicians even when the party itself is opposed. And in times of, of instability, that can work in our favor. We certainly saw that um, when the liberals were the third party, uh, and the NDP was the official opposition at the national level, and half the caucus of the Liberals voted with the NDP on a motion around proportional representation. The Liberals, you know, weren't in favor, but individual Liberals were. Um, and so I think that's an important lesson we've learned. We've learned that the media, while traditionally opposed to our issue, can sometimes be shamed. Um, and we saw this last year, that both the Globe and Mail and the Toronto Star, historically foes, of our topic, both came out in favor of it. Now, it's hard to know if it'll stick. The Globe and Mail had previously been in favor of PR for a short time, but that is something, and that wouldn't have happened without the work uh, that Fair Vote Canada and others had done to keep putting this issue on the agenda. But here's the thing I really wanna underline with you tonight, which is that there is an element of randomness and luck in what we are doing. We cannot underestimate how um, events uh, that we can't predict uh, can't anticipate uh, and can't necessarily be controlled by the traditional power brokers, um, create or foreclose openings for the work that we are trying to do. So I'm, 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 I'm sort of suggesting that our, our way forward has to be about being ready uh, and looking for the breaks. Uh, being ready doesn't guarantee uh, that you will succeed, but if you're not ready, you won't be in a position to take advantage of any unexpected breaks that may come your way. So it, it's absolutely essential, but it is not determinative in the final instance. Uh, and, I, I, you know, look at New Zealand. New Zealand saw a lot of hard work over 25 years uh, to get them to the point of adopting proportional representation. But it wasn't just hard work. They benefited from some really dough-headed decisions from politicians, uh, politicians who thought that they could somehow deflect or delay and only ended up intensifying the support. Uh, they had a prime minister who misread his notes during a debate um, and promised something that his party was not committed to doing. Um, so, so we cannot underestimate um, how uh, unanticipated consequences, unanticipated events can become the opening that we're looking for. Um, and, and again, looking at the process in the United Kingdom that brought PR to the subnational level in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, and brought proportional voting for European voting until Brexit, um, in the UK benefited from all of the work that the Electoral Reform Society had done over the previous hundred years. Um, so we, we, we have to recognize that being ready, doing the work is an essential part of what we're doing, but we don't know when the break will happen or how things might turn our way. And we've been close, 
We've been so close. Now, you know, we, we, we won the referendum in PEI, but the powers that be wriggled out of it and came very close to winning the next referendum in PEI. You know, 58% of voters in BC said yes to SDV, but you know, supermajority rule. Uh, next time around, and well, actually in 2018, you know, 50% plus one would have been enough, but there weren't enough votes in favor of change in that referendum. If only, you know, that's, I mean, it just shows you a bit more support and we could have been on our way, but we didn't get lucky. Whereas New Zealand did, 54% uh, was enough to get them PR when they voted on it. I wish I could give you a formula for success. And I always get asked about that. What do we need to do? Um, but voting system reform experience is one of tendencies. Um, so increases in the party system tend to make voting system reform more likely, so more parties. A breakdown in political consensus, uh, threats to the major players, social crisis like wars um, and depressions, um, and random unpredictable opportunities uh, are the stuff of the episodes that I've looked at in my research. So I guess I'm stopping with lessons learned. Uh, we, we definitely have learned a lot of lessons in the last two decades, and we have to live with hope. I mean, what, what other choice have we got? Uh, you know, we've got to just keep moving forward, doing some of the work we're doing, uh, but being eagle-eyed about whatever opportunities may come our way. So that's me talking. I went on a little longer than I intended, uh, but now I want to turn things over to you with the help of the able hands of Anita um, and uh, Michelle to uh, get to the topics that you want to talk about tonight. Thank you so much, Dennis. That was a great talk. Um, you did a good job of summing up the past 20 years in uh, 30 minutes. Pretty good. <laughs> yeah, pretty and also... Fun. I think that's the first time that, I mean, and Dennis and I have been doing webinars, it's probably, well, 10 or 15 years or something. It's a long time. And that's the first time I've heard Dennis reflect on um, how far we've come in a really substantial way um, to be able to look back that far and see how much things have changed in the last you know, number of years. It's really, really encouraging to hear. So some of the questions that came in are, yes, those familiar questions that we always get and uh, that we don't have magic answers for, but let's have a little go at it first. So the first couple are asking our favorite question, which is, how can the government be made to enact a change that they don't want? And I've got a few different varieties of that same question, which boils down to how, how can we get the big parties on board for something that seems obviously not in their interests? Okay, well, you know, as I said, there's no a single answer. And the problem is that they learn. Uh, so something that works in one instance, you know, they get wise to, uh, and then they come up with some other way of blocking it. And that was certainly the case with the New Zealand example, right? I mean, New Zealand didn't just scare the bejesus out of the New Zealand elites. It freaked out all of the different Anglo-American elites because they could see the writing on the wall as governments were introducing policies that the public didn't want, and the other party was promising to do the same thing, everybody was turning to something else. And so we saw a, 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 an episode of policy learning where the Gordon Campbell government definitely was following what was happening in New Zealand, and they made particular surgical changes to the process. So in New Zealand, you didn't need a supermajority uh, to uh, get the change through, but British Columbia did. In New Zealand, they set up a very effective public education process BC, they didn't bother. Uh, so it really is interesting to see. And then when PEI came after British Columbia, they adopted all of the shenanigans that BC had done. Ontario did the same, and they added a few new wrinkles. Um, so, but, you know, if we were to sit here and plot uh, our, our change, obviously a minority government situation uh, is one that's more, more tenable. Uh, but it would need to be backed up by a pretty significant public mobilization around the issue. And one can imagine the kind of conditions that would contribute to it, uh, perhaps the de defeat of a, of, a, of a deeply unpopular, say, conservative government, um, and then the election of a minority government, maybe liberal with NDP support and Greens, um, that could create the conditions uh, for change. There are no other barriers. There's no constitutional barriers. Uh, all this fluff we hear from, from some about all these other things that could happen. No, that if the government wants to change the voting system, if parliament wants to change the voting system, they can do it. Um, but it will probably occur in a situation where no party has a majority, um, or it will happen in a situation where we face a crisis that no party wants to take responsibility for. Um, and then, of course, sharing the blame is the natural way of approaching it. 
Yeah, I like what, the way you're framing it because I've sort of reflected on the same thing, Dennis. We've got a lot smarter in the last 25 years, but so have our opponents. So it's sort of, it's a bit of a chess game or something with them, right? Where they we've learned some things and they've learned some things too. So somebody else has asked about, um, why do advocates in the United States promote um, ranked ballot? And by ranked ballot, I'm saying alternative vote, the winner take all version, and we do not. So obviously context matters. Every country is different. That's why we can't just import, you know, one size fits all thing, right? I mean, when we got started, when I got started on this question, you know, in 1990, um, there was a ferocious debate about which system, you know, was the right one. And you had advocates who loved the German, then it was just the German mixed member system. And But the Anglo choice had traditionally been the single transferable vote. That was the system that was used in Ireland. That was the system that was used for uh, elections to the... Uh, university seats in the United Kingdom in the interwar period. So there's been all this experience with single transferable vote. That was the system we used in Canada um, in, in various uh, uh, situations. So, um, so that was the context and we had to get over that. We had to figure out a way forward to get past the system wars. In the United States, the problem is that there are various um, laws that prevent third parties from entering the political realm. Both the Democrats and Republicans, as much as they appear to hate each other, hate anyone else more. Uh, and they conspire to put barriers in the way of third parties getting on the ballot. You know, to put a third party on a Canadian ballot is not hard. Um, you know, you need some signatures, you know, you gotta get to work, uh, but you can get you can get on there if you want to, if you're dogged. The United States, that's not the case. I mean, it's not the same because it's all decentralized. Each state has a different model. But for the most part, in the states that matter, it is very difficult for a third party to get on the ballot. So that's why Americans tend to talk about the transferable ballot, uh, a majoritarian system, because mostly they're talking about an independent candidate trying to get in the game uh, without necessarily benefiting Democrats or Republicans. Uh, so that's, you know, I, and look, it, it was controversial there, too. I was at the founding of the American Center for Voting and Democracy back in um, 1995. I went to Boston, hung out with all of them. Um, and it, it was very clear that there were many people who wanted a, a, a commitment to proportional representation. But the facts on the ground are that that's not where the political action is. We have an easier time in Canada because we have a multi-party system. And so the logic of what we're doing hits people. You know, we, when we go in and say, look, you know, don't you think all the parties should get what they, what, what people voted for? Isn't that, shouldn't it be a reflection of their popular support? And people go, okay, yeah, that kind of makes sense to me, given what I already know about the political system. But in America, you're kind of starting from a different place. Yeah. I mean, I would also say too, that after about 20 years of promoting almost almost exclusively promoting winner take all ranked ballot fair vote USA is starting to shift I don't know if you, you folks that have, are following it have seen that and there's some other players now coming in promoting proportional representation in the United States because if you're able to talk about it now without sounding like some kind of wing nut you know so the political situation is sort of slowly shifting in the United States, but for sure proportional representation is what makes sense in Canada. I have a few people in the Q&A who are sort of asking the same question. It's, it's around being baffled as to why the Liberal MPs would have voted against motion M86 for a citizens assembly when everybody who follows politics can see that the polls are showing a 200 plus seat majority government coming for Pierre Polyev, why would those MPs vote no? Can you address that, Dennis? Well, here, you know, you you know, when there's a there's a there's a take in, in politics that says that um, politicians are rational actors who want to get reelected, and that's what motivates them. And so this is a very neat kind of way of explaining their motivation because they respond to voters because they want to get reelected. The problem with this approach is it's kind of naive about the real world of politics because the real world of politics is about money. There's almost like a triangle, you know, between the politicians and the money and the public. And the ability of the public to hold the politician to them and what they want depends on the role of the money. Of course, in the United States, there are no national laws preventing the spending of money. So billions of dollars are spent in the election cycle. And it's all spent to try to limit the debate, control the narrative, push the agenda of those who are spending the money. In the Canadian context, you might think, oh, things are looking bad for the liberals. Why don't they jump on our topic? 
because they're not thinking so short term. I mean, sure, individual politicians might be thinking that way, but the party as an organization does not. You know, when you are the traditional winner and hey, the liberals have won the most elections and been in government in Canada more than anyone else, a lot more. Eh, they got a vested interest in keeping the system the way it is. They might lose now, but they can count on winning later. Parties that start to change are ones that start to think they're going to be losers. You know, when they think, uh oh, we're losing our, let me go back to that term, hegemonic position, um, then they start to think, you know what, maybe we should change the voting system. Maybe there's a new competitor that's going to cut into their support. But generally speaking, um, because our two main political parties, the liberals and conservatives, they do their job in part because they have the kind of control they do, right? The, the ability to pay back the favors, change the laws that powerful people want, that requires them to have all the power, right? If they have to share the power, ugh, now it's harder. Now you got to get two parties to agree to whatever deal you've cooked up. You know, SNC-Lavalin is harder to pull off, you know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a situation where two parties are sharing power rather than one party because there's an awful lot of secrecy that goes in on our system. And often we don't find out about the shenanigans that have gone on until the party is booted from power. And then suddenly the books are open and it's like, oh, look at all of these shady dealings that were going on. You know, personally, I think it would be better if that stuff was out in the open so that it wouldn't happen. Uh, and that's of course, one of the reasons why I think proportional systems are better. But I think that should help you to understand why, even though they're heading for a loss, liberals are still not prepared to give up the system. I'm, I'm wondering if you can reflect a little bit too, Dennis, um, on maybe some of the pressure that some of those MPs felt, because it's it was interesting to me to see that, you know, we succeeded in getting 39 of them to vote for this, which was really sort of historic, considering the fact that MPs vote along party lines 99% of the time. But for any of them that were sort of still, you know, the default position is just to do whatever the government says. You know, so I'm wondering if you can comment on maybe some of the internal dynamics that went on there that influenced some of the other ones we weren't able to reach. And I just have to go get my cord to plug in my computer. So I'll leave you for a second. Will you answer um, that? Let me say, I'm, I'm really impressed with the discussion that's going on in the chat and the Q&A. Wow, there's a lot of, uh, forget about me, you guys are having your own conversation. Uh, a lot of expertise uh, being shared about the different processes. That's uh, that's really great. Um, okay, the question was, um, uh, party discipline. And, you know, scholars who study this will note that um, uh, Canadian party discipline is very, very strong, much stronger than, say, in the UK. And part of that is that in the UK, there are so many members, 650 plus MPs, uh, not all of them are going to make it to the front bench. Not They know that. Um, and uh, some of them have a, a fairly loyal constituency, so they're going to get reelected. And so some argue this is why you see a greater level of independence of, of MPs. On the other hand, you know, people we know vote party. Uh, you know, people say they might like the local MP, but often that's a post hoc rationalization. Everybody uses party as a way of navigating the system. And politicians are that way too. Politicians join parties because they support that party, because they like what they think. They also understand that it's a quid pro quo. You can't go into a situation and say, well, I'm only going to be here for the things I agree with, right? As a collective entity, you say, well, look, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm here because I want to see these six issues go forward. But, you know, I'll also support your four issues because you're going to support my six issues. So it's that kind of log rolling trade off, which is not a bad thing in a democracy. Uh, it's, it's how you get things done. Um, but it does mean that it can be difficult to move divisive topics forward. And often you'll see issues where the prime minister will make it an issue. Like the prime minister will say, look, I, you know, there's issues I don't care as much about, but this one you're going to fall in line on. Um, and so, and, and there's a lot of backroom pressure that people feel, you know, politicians may be ambitious. They want to move up the ladder. They want to become uh, personal secretaries, and then they want to become cabinet ministers, or maybe they want to become the prime minister or leader of their party. And not playing ball is a pretty direct route not to getting those things. Uh, so those are some of the reasons why you see that. Okay. Um, all right. I think a lot of these we have already addressed. Uh, so somebody's asking about referendums. So do, would you just maybe in general comment on referendums as a strategy to get electoral reform or reflect on that a little bit? That'll cover a lot of questions related to that. You know what? I was looking in the chat and I missed the last part of your question. 
Oh, but can you comment on referendums? Oh, so somebody right. here who's new is saying, you know, what was the results of the referendums, which sort of just leads into how right. have referendums worked or not worked for the electoral reform movement? Yeah, you know, I mean, referendums, I think for people, they say, oh, have a vote. I mean, we're a voting system group. Surely we should be in favor of referendums. What's more democratic than voting? Um, the problem is, is that when we study referendums, what we discover is that um, most people are not paying attention. You know, most people don't know very much about institutions. The whole idea of a referendum is that, well, the politicians shouldn't make the decision on this question. It should be the people. The people should make the decision. But the people are not really ready to make the decision because they don't know anything about it. So what do they do? Well, they end up looking at the party that they support. So we come up with a process that's supposed to be about putting the voter first, but in, end, in the end is just reflected party positions. You know, when we break down the votes, what we discover is that conservatives are much more likely to vote against voting system reform. New Democrats are much more in favor. Liberals are split. Hey, that looks like the party system. Um, and so in that sense, um, it's not it's not a good use of public money unless you're going to spend a lot of money to bring people up to speed. I mean, we know that people can handle the details. The Citizens Assemblies made that clear. The Citizens Assemblies drew people from all walks of life. And uh, hey, they got a handle on it. But every week for a number of months, they attended sessions where they talked about it and explored it and got up to, and felt competent about it, which is not the case for the average voter. The average voter goes, eh, I don't know, what's this about? Um, and so the party that wins the referendum is the party that can mobilize the strongest response to the question. And we saw that in British Columbia in the last referendum in 2018, when the liberals, which of course were really a conservative party um, at the provincial level, uh, made it an existential question. And just, you know, they were telling all kinds of stories about what would happen if, uh, you know, a new voting system were adopted by the end of times. Um, so, you know, in that sense, you know, referendums are, are, are not that much closer to the people. Um, and they're often invoked and pushed for very undemocratic reasons. I mean, the only reasons that we see, for instance, conservatives pushing so hard on referendums is because they know the facts, which is that when things are pushed to a refer referendum, their voters are going to pay more attention than others. Uh, and so they're going to win. You know, it's not that they want to know what the people think. Um, they think they can win. Uh, and so that's why that's why they push it. Yeah. Would you address some of the I remember when you started, you said, you know, when fair vote started, there was a lot of people who were just like, oh, why don't we just do like New Zealand? And I mean, I still get trickles of that, not as much as 10 years ago, mind you, but I still do get that sometimes. Why don't we just have the, the two part question or the, you know, there's people that just have some uh, particular idea that if they had a certain kind of question on the referendum ballot, whether it's one particular system or it's a clearly explained proposal, or if it's a two part question or if it's a ranked ballot or whatever, then that's gonna be the thing that would make the successful referendum. Could you just address that a little bit? I get that a lot. So the name of my book is The Politics of Voting. <laughs> now you might think that sounds kind of dumb. I mean, yeah, politics, you know, you vote in politics. What I mean by the title is that the voting process itself is political in that every aspect of our electoral system, which covers everything, voter registration, you know, all kinds of questions, how we shape the writings, that electoral system, every single part of it has been vetted by the by politics, by political parties, by the opinion leaders. Um, and they're making their decisions on the basis of what kind of decisions will help them win. How can they benefit? They want to they want to frustrate their foes and they want to advantage their friends. And so the politics of all these referendums is, is, is obvious once you start looking for it. So you think, oh, they said the problem was that there wasn't enough choice. You know, and when we had the first referendum on STV, people said, I don't like STV. This is ridiculous. Why can't the people choose, you know, the system they want? OK, so 2018, they get a choice. This choice is terrible. Like it's so confusing. How can we have this choice system? You're trying to confuse the public. This is wrong. Okay, before you said we needed a choice. Now you're saying we shouldn't have a choice. Hmm. Seems to me like you're just offering up any excuse to derail the process. And make no mistake, they threw everything at that 2018 referendum. I mean, on the one hand, the, the liberals were essentially the no campaign, the BC liberals. Um, they threw an enormous amount of money into public advertisements and radio ads that the talking points were all factually wrong, but 
didn't matter uh, because it doesn't matter what 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 is the truth. It only matters what people believe the truth to be. But at the same time, a group of very well-funded business people started taking various questions to the courts. So they tried to get an injunction to have the referendum thrown out. And when that didn't work, they brought a court case forward to try to contest the ballot. And when that didn't work, then, I mean, so I, I, I'm trying to lay out the story here, right, to get you to see that you think you are going to win this by coming up with the right question that everyone is going to recognize as fair and just. What I'm telling you is this is a political fight. It's a political fight between wildly unequal forces um, where what is the public interest is much less important to the various actors than winning. We, on the other hand, do have the advantage of putting the public interest first. That's what we are trying to do. And you know, when I speak to people from across the political spectrum, I say, I'm a Democrat. I believe your vote should count. And I don't care if you're conservative or you're a People's Party or you're a new Democrat or you're a Green. If people voted for you, that's the Democratic way. And so you deserve representation if you get enough support. And so in that sense, sometimes we can leverage that. But it's still very, very hard. I think, you know, one of the webinars that we did, the last one I did with Dennis back in August was after we sort of looked at a whole bunch of uh, just summarizing how other countries got PR. And it was very interesting to discover how uncommon it is to bring in PR by a referendum and how almost all countries that got PR, it was because of a multi-party agreement. So that's one of the reasons why Fair Vote Canada after seven referendums and just looking at real world experience provided to us by Dennis tries to push for those multi-party agreements and uh, compromises rather than push push it to a referendum, which has all the problems that Dennis mentioned. Um, so a couple of people are asking about municipal reform. They're saying, does it is it easier? I'm sort of paraphrasing a few different things I'm sort of seeing. You know, is it easier to start municipally? Is it easier to start locally? Is that the place to to break in? And would that, you know, get people used to it or whatever? The short answer is no. Um, you know, the longer answer is maybe. Uh, you know, the the um, I mean they are literally, you know, longer, but the the point here is that, you know, people think the local will be easier. And and one of the reasons they think it is because the degree of opposition will be different, right? You you don't have parties in many cases. Uh in some cases you have slates. Um, and so they think that, well, there won't be that that barrier to change. Uh, but the difficulty you have at the local level is that without parties, it's also harder to reach people, harder to mobilize people. And we know, for instance, uh, my my colleague at York, Bob McDermott, did a study of funding of, of local uh, campaigns outside of Toronto, found that 80% of the funding was from developers. Um, so they are setting the agenda, right? They are determining who the candidates will be because they're the ones funding them. And so you can't choose something that isn't there. Um, and, you know, you need money to run. Um, these Even these local councils are increasingly larger. Uh, you know, the, the wards are larger. Um, and so, it, it you know, it's just that much harder. So I don't think it's easier. And the public demonstration idea at the local level has never worked. I mean, it's a nice idea, but it's never led to a copycat effect, right? We saw 19 municipalities adopt uh, SDV voting in Canada after World War I didn't lead anywhere, you know, to the adoption of PR somewhere else. Uh, where we did see semi-proportional systems adopted in Manitoba and Alberta, um, it really was for very different reasons than that. And we can go outside Canada. We can look at the attempts in the United Kingdom, and we can look at the attempts in in um, the other Anglo-American countries, New Zealand, Australia. Nowhere does local campaign. It didn't work in the United States. That's where they ended up with a considerable number of, of towns, including New York City, uh, using proportional representation for a decade and a half. Um, doesn't doesn't you know you've got to look at the political forces that are for and against change uh that's that's the bellwether not the public i mean that's the discourse is that the public decides but they don't our institutions are all designed well before the public comes on the scene um and the public is rarely given a look in except through processes like referendums which are basically manipulated by the same forces that we're trying to stop with the referendum all right, so somebody else is asking, and I actually don't get this question as much anymore, but I'm going to ask you anyway, because it's I'm sure it's going to keep coming up. Does the fact that there are many different forms of PR make it more difficult to get agreement on adopting PR without detailing the exact way it might work? In other words, would it all be easier if voting reformers just all agreed on one system and said, this is the one? Yeah. 
Again, you know, I, I just draw you back to that essential lesson that I think my research points to, which is the politics. Um, you know, to what extent are people wanting to know about specific systems as a way of derailing the conversation altogether? Now, again, average folks, you know, I think it's not uncommon that some of them will say, oh, you, you want to do something else? What's it going to look like? I mean, that's a practical question. I, I, it's a common sense question in many ways. Um, but the thing that you have to try to recognize is that sometimes people ask for things that they don't really want. You know, they, they don't really want all the details. Um, you've got to be very um, artistic uh, in responding. Um, you know, I often start by saying that people don't really understand the current system. You know, they think they do uh, because they can mark the ballot, but they don't understand the implications of it. You know, when you say to them, well, you know, how did Doug Ford turn 40% of the vote into 65% of the seats? I'll just sit back. You tell me. I mean, this is the system that's supposed to be so simple. This is the system that's supposed to be so transparent, but it isn't. And, and so people actually have a false sense of confidence about what they think they know about our current system, which is why the debate is often so unfair, right? You, it's the problem of concision. You know, it's always harder to talk about something that people don't already know than something they think they do know. Uh, so the, the debate is kind of kind of unequal. So yeah, no, I don't think that having agreement on one a model uh, is going to get you forward. Uh, it's going to be easier for the activists, I think, because you can unify your message and maybe if people feel very strongly about different systems. But again, you know, one of the things, and I know this is not a consensus position, is that there's really not much difference, you know, when it comes right down to it, when it, when in terms of like what most people are doing in politics, it doesn't really matter which system you do, as long as it's proportional, as long as it's proportional, you will attack the very thing that is the root of the work that we do on PR, which is breaking phony majority governments, forcing governments to work together with multiple parties and creating a competitive system that will allow the people when they want to choose differently to do so. And by doing so, affect the balance of power that exists in our legislative system. How that gets done, there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, but the public is not going to get into all the minutia of those systems. And drawing them in is a pretty good way of turning them off. I have to agree with Dennis. And I, I think, you know, I can reflect back on, you know, the 15 or so years that I've been here. And I get that quest, that push for us to just pick a system and just push that a lot less than I used to because I think people have seen over so many referendums and campaigns and promises and the more we're explaining the more we're losing basically that that's not a path to PR and so right now in the last five years or so we've been united around the idea of pushing for a citizens assembly not because a citizens assembly is a magic way to PR obviously it's not but because we're working on that long-term um project of encouraging the parties to negotiate you know I mean, I, and that is a, that is a step and a citizens assembly is not a divisive issue compared to okay. when voting system geeks get into you know arguing well, their system I, mean, I, I feel your pain right i mean i as you can imagine i've talked to a lot of people about this topic um over the years and it's tough if someone comes to you and says look i want to know x you know you feel like you have to respond I, i'm totally sympathetic to that but I, all i'm saying is is that you have to judge the context you're in you know if you've got a group of people and one person wants to go down the rabbit hole let's talk after the meeting um hey i've got some resources that you can look at you know what you're really interested in that and there's some people who are really expert in that i'm going to connect you with them right but focus your main message on results it's results, you know, everybody think you've got that uncle who's always looking under the hood, you know, oh, what's this uh, motor? It's a V8, you know, everybody else doesn't care, right? Everybody else cares about performance. People care about what will be the results. If I buy this, what will I get? And that's what the lion's share of your focus should be on is our political system is producing these kinds of results generally. And that's what you've said you don't like. And these systems do this differently. Would, do you like that? Do you like how that sounds? Like talk about results, get concrete in terms of the kinds of things that PR countries produce. That's how you're going to get their, their interest and get them away from the minutia questions and more interested in the results that they might get from change. Yeah, 100% agree. People care about outcomes. Okay, I wanted to, I'm going to go down a couple of small little rabbit holes. So I hope everybody bears with me before we go ahead back to a general kind of question to finish up. So some people are asking about the charter challenge. Would you like to comment on the status of that, Dennis? 
and just in general, and maybe on the pushing through the courts. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, the people who were behind this did an awful lot of work and they're great people. And they brought in so many interesting experts and they put together, you know, a really strong case. Um, but, you know, courts are a risky proposition uh, because courts can do things you like, but courts can also do things you don't like. And uh, so the court case went forward in the fall. I was trying to follow it. Um, you know, I was meeting with some of the people who were involved. Um, the decision came out much more quickly than I thought. I read the decision by the judge. And I think there's some worrying aspects to that decision. Um, I think the judge um, uh, says a bunch of things that are not good for our movement. Uh, I'm not, no, I mean, the judge was just out to lunch. I mean, he didn't understand the documents he was looking at. He drew wrong conclusions from what the experts were saying. I mean, I, I think if this goes to appeal, you know, there'll be a way to try to, um, uh, to, try to, to, to deal with that. Um, but the bottom line is that, you know, one of the things that I took from reading the judge's um, response was that he thought that the voting system was constitutional um, and that it was in the original constitution. Of course, it isn't. Um, and that is very worrying because to the extent that those who are pushing this line and it's coming from the Canadian constitutional bunch out in Alberta, um, you know, they're basically trying to prevent any change by making it a mega constitutional issue, uh, which it isn't. Um, so that's always a risk. It's always a risk that, you know, judges will stick something in that now you've got to try to get past. Okay, and I also wanted to take a little detour over to the Yukon because that is where things are happening right now for us most immediately. Do you want to comment on that, Dennis, or do you want me to, either one? I do, I do but I notice in the chat, which the things keep popping up uh, on my screen here, and, and I, yep. you know, I, see, I see an awful lot of questions. Wow, so many questions. I'd love to deal with them all. And I see some people are a little frustrated the question isn't being answered. All I can Go say ahead. is... I, I know that um, I know that Anita is trying to get, you know, trying to pull out from all these different questions. But if you have a question that we don't get to, you are absolutely welcome to email me. I'm happy to follow up with you. If you think that I can offer you anything or recommend anything or just chat with you about it, I'm totally happy to do that. So don't worry if, if you're not getting it. We have limited time. So obviously we can't necessarily deal with everyone. But if you would like to, it's an invitation I always make to everybody. Put my email in the chat to, uh, if, if someone can do that. And I'm happy to chat with you if you want. Um, Ab absolutely, absolutely. I want to say, you know, I've, I cannot follow the chat. My brain doesn't deal with that many different things at once. So I'm following the Q&A and there's 62 different questions in there. And I'm trying to just pull out the ones that I think, you know, if if there was a newcomer on here, what would be the most generally useful thing for them to hear? And I know that's frustrating when people have really specific things they want to ask Dennis. And so it's great that he's always available. Do you want to just um, talk a little so bit about what's going on in the Yukon? And Yukon, I mean, you know, it was another situation where the whole thing was happening for political reasons. There was a minority liberal government and uh, the NDP said, you know, you want support, you're going to give us uh, a legislative committee to look at the voting system. Uh, but of course, they started it. And part of the deal was they brought in an expert who set the tone in all the traditional ways, uh, basically privileging the existing system, offering up a bunch of arguments that really have no support. Um, they hauled in a whole bunch of experts who, frankly, in my opinion, aren't really experts on the topic. Uh, they love to talk about it, but they don't, haven't done any real research on it. Um, and so I tried to intervene. I tried to set the scene on what I thought they should do. Basically, they've come out in favor of a process that would involve public consultation, probably a referendum, um, and that they would uh, want to maintain a local member. Uh, they're really concerned about rural underrepresentation, which really means, of course, maintaining rural overrepresentation. So there are some very problematic things that come out of it. And I, I imagine that not much is going to come from it, but maybe you have some other insights, uh, Anita. I would just give a little plug to our Yukon team. I see uh, Sue is here tonight from Fair Vote Yukon. And I just, just to give everybody a bit of hope, and you all know how cynical I am about referendum, seven was quite enough for me. Probably six was good. Um, <laughs> we are heading for another one in the Yukon after the Citizens Assembly and Electoral Reform, which is going to start in May. The report will be due at the end of October. And then any recommendation recommendation for a change to the voting system will go to a referendum in the Yukon, and I would imagine that referendum will be in conjunction with the next election. Um, I would just say for, for those folks who are looking for a little bit of hope in the Yukon, first of all, we have an absolutely fantastic team in the Yukon, wonderful people. Uh, the second thing about the Yukon is there's about 45,000 people. So I just want to draw everybody's attention to the, yeah. after the initial 
BC referendum where we got 58% of the vote and they ignored that. Anyway, um, the referendum down the road that the plebiscite that reformers did win was in PEI in 2016. And what really helped in PEI, it helped them win that. Many things helped them, not all in our control. The thing within our control that helped them win that is PEI is so small that they could literally go from kitchen to kitchen. They could knock on every door. They could call people. It's it's that small. So when they can, when they had, you know, 150, 200 volunteers knocking on thousands of doors, it really gave them a chance in PEI that we we really didn't have in, in in places like Ontario and BC, when you're looking at 15 million people, you can't reach those people. In the Yukon, almost everybody lives in Whitehorse, the, about two thirds of them. It's possible for our team to reach those people. So I would just say there's nothing really, there's not a lot that we outside of the Yukon as people from away that don't live in that community can really do, but we are cheering on our local team and I will keep everybody posted. And you can go to fairvoteyukon.ca and uh, check out, I'll be keeping updates there on what's happening with the Citizens Assembly as it gets going in the work of our local team. You know, Anita, um, let, me, let, me, let me revise my comments because, you know, I'm letting my frustration with the politicians and the experts, you know, run away with me here. It goes against my message, which is that um, accidents can happen. And by accidents, I mean that sometimes a process is sponsored that gets away from those who sponsored it, hoping that nothing will come of it. Um, but you're yeah. absolutely right to draw attention to the context, which is very different in Yukon. And so in that sense, maybe the networks can be used in a way that can get past some of the scale problems that we see in places like British Columbia uh, and Ontario, where you just got millions and millions. It's so hard, right, to, to reach them without money. Um, but it, you know, it's a very different case in Yukon. So look, and the Yukon team is great. Uh, so obviously we all want to do what we can to support them. We've got a chance. That's, that's the best I can tell people. And I know I said the same thing with M86, but I'm, it's true. We really have a chance in the Yukon. Um, okay. So Dennis, have you seen any other questions that before I move on to any final questions that have come up for you, like any themes that you'd like to address that are coming up in the chat that I'm not following? Wow, you know, there's just so much here, and uh, and you know, wow, what a, what a, what a group of people. I mean, you know, there's some really well informed people. Uh, you know, some who clearly are better informed on some aspects of the question than I am. So, and that's great. I mean, we need we need that kind of team, right? We, you know, it, it it's this isn't a one man show, right? I mean, I've carved out a niche that I work on, um, but I'm happy to share the stage and the space with others who who can offer you know their expertise and insights. So that's really that's really fabulous. Um, uh, I did see some people talk about those classic questions of authoritarianism, and I'll just say a word or two about that. Uh, you know, we don't hear it as much anymore because, frankly, it sounds ridiculous. You know, it sounds ridiculous to point to Nazi Germany uh, and say, well, you know, they had PR. It's, well, you know, I, my, my standard response is to say, well, um, uh, Zimbabwe has first passed the post. Oh, gosh, I guess we better get rid of that system. Look what it's led to. I mean, it's ridiculous. It sounds ridiculous because obviously Zimbabwe's problems are not limited to the use of first past the post. And the situation in Germany, in Nazi Germany, was not in any way restricted to the use of proportional voting. Um, all the other West, all the other Western European countries were using PR as well. Um, and they didn't succumb to the same kinds of politics. So I think, you know, it's just it's it's a ridiculous claim and it, it's an uninformed one. And we have, you know, now a hundred years of experience uh to say that authoritarianism can rise in any kind of system system when there's enough public support for it. And we're certainly seeing that in first past the post countries. Yeah, I would say it's in the amount of authoritarianism around the world is increasing. And for many of our supporters, that's increasing the urgency they feel for, for Canada to move to a more proportional system because they're quite concerned about the power being concentrated with the wrong person or group. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Question, voter turnout. That's a you know a classic uh, question that comes up. Uh, nuanced response. Uh, the answer is maybe. Uh, you know, if we look at the statistical information, uh, PR systems tend to have higher voter turnout, but they've also seen declines. Um, on the other hand, we saw in New Zealand that the introduction of PR led to a change in the makeup of the electorate. Uh, so people who had felt undercounted, uh, not included, uh, excluded, uh, not represented, they were much more likely to vote in a PR system. So in that sense, even though we didn't see a dramatic aggregate change in voter turnout in New Zealand, we did see really important changes uh, in voter turnout from women, from indigenous uh, New Zealanders. So there's some really interesting nuances uh, on that question of, um, of voter turnout. Um, 
There's just so many questions okay. here and really good ones. Did you see okay. another question? Well, I mean, I one theme that's coming up over and over again um, is the upcoming federal election. So let's just assume that's in 2025, right? So people are wondering basically how the, the fair voting movement can capitalize on the upcoming federal election, especially considering uh, looking at the polls, you know, we should be having, seeing some more interested people and open minds on this topic. <laughs> what would be your best advice to us, Dennis, over the next year or so? Well, I mean, I think one of the real concerns I have is that when we get towards elections, we always start to hear about strategic voting. And we always start, you know, people say, oh, you know, this, I hate this party. You know, you need to vote for this party to stop that party. And that is a one-way street to nowheresville as far as our topic goes. Because if there's something that's really, really strong, uh, it's that uh, PR tends to follow an increase in the party system. You've got to create some costs for these political organizations. As long as they can win it all, they've got an incredible incentive to hang on with their nails forever. Only by increasing the competition in the party system do you start to impose costs uh, on those other parties. So I think you know you, people have got to resist the strategic voting arguments that well, we've all got to vote liberal to stop the conservatives or we all got to vote liberal to stop the NDP or whatever is the strategic you know, issue. You've got to try to avoid that because um, what we've seen is that what's been keeping this issue alive? Instability in the party system. Instability in the party system has kept the issue alive in PEI, in New Brunswick, in Quebec, in British Columbia, and at the national level. It's the most constant factor that has kept us popping up like the bobblehead. Um, you know, every time, you know, our opponents say, you're dead, you lost that, you're out of here, stop talking about it. And then the issue comes back. And it comes back precisely because the party systems are not settling uh, into a two-party norm as we've been used to. Yeah, really, really, really important point. We need more parties in parliament pushing for this. That's going to increase our odds. That's what Dennis has been always saying to us. That's what the research shows. That's what practical experience in Canada shows. The closer we get to two parties, the more our odds go down, the more parties we have, the more our odds go up. We have it has to threaten the big two or yeah, that's, what's going to change. Um, okay. Is, do you see any other ones? I think I've got everything that I saw. Um, I mean, you know, it, 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 uh, I was, I was sort of, uh, well, someone asked about the constitution question. The answer is no, uh, but again, it's political, right? The, the, the forces that don't want PR are going to keep leaning on this idea that the voting system is constitutional, which would prevent a party from coming to power with a commitment to introduce a new voting system? Because you know the idea that we need a referendum is, is not correct. Uh, that's a political choice. Uh, we had uh, 10 voting system changes in this country before the 1960s at the provincial level, all just introduced by a simple vote of their, of their legislatures. Um, so this is a political strategy. Uh, when people say, oh, you know, it's constitutional, it's because they don't want it. And they think that by putting a constitutional barrier in, they can prevent it from happening. But it's a political argument, not a factual one. Um, what does elite mean in Canada? Uh, that's a, a, an excellent question. Uh, our sociologists work very hard on that to try to figure out what is the, obviously there's many different kinds of elites. Uh, you know, there are intellectual elites, there are uh, elites around different issues. Uh, there's a music elite, you know. Um, I think that when I talk about the party elites, I'm talking about the people who run the organizations and who have the highest positions in those parties, uh, typically the leaders and the cadre of people around the leader. Um, they um, they are, are, are seen as the elites um, because they have the sticks and carrots that can keep the people who vote with the party and give them their legislative power um, in line. So, and then we have elites, uh, often I think people, when they talk about elite, they mean financial elites. They mean those who have the wherewithal to enter into discussion with a degree of weight that the average citizen does not. You know, the average citizen doesn't really have very much impact at all, uh, unless they act collectively, unless they join some group that can speak as one and get the attention of those who decide what the issues are. So I, I'm using it in a, in a fairly flexible way, but I think you get my message in terms of what I think an elite is. Dennis, another comment just came up, I'm noticing that we haven't touched on yet, and that's the influence of the media. So somebody was asking us, you know, what uh, mass media have you worked with to get this message out or something like that? Would you want to comment a little bit on the media, the role of it, how it's changed? Well, I mean, uh, 
obviously media studies is a whole subfield, uh, you know, at, in the in the university. There's been a lot of study about media over the last hundred years. Um, and but I can tell you, as someone who's worked on this issue, and I've done research on the media representation of the issue. I mean, particularly around the 2007 um, uh, uh, referendum in Ontario, they were not balanced in their approach. I mean, if media um, is a reflection of the people, uh, then it's a pretty wonky reflection uh, because they did not reflect the different views. They didn't reflect the different kinds of experts that were available to speak to the issue. And they didn't play a role really in helping people to understand you know, what would be involved in making the change. Um, and of course, people ask questions, why? Why? I mean, the star, you know, why was the star so against proportional representation? Why was the Globe and Mail? Why is the National Post so against uh, these changes? Why do all their columnists condemn it? Well, again, politics, it's politics. Uh, in the case of the, the, the right-wing press, the Globe and Mail and National Post, it's because they support the Conservative Party and they want the Conservative Party to win and they want the Conservative Party to respond to the business interests that support those corporate media. In the case of the Toronto Star, it's a little harder, right? The Toronto Star has always pitched itself as something different, but essentially they've been a liberal paper. And they also believe in a kind of elite accommodation approach to politics where people get together and make a deal, uh, you know, for the good of the people. Um, and so I'm not in any way trying to take away from the star being, um, uh, you know, a, a different kind of paper. I think it obviously does represent a different kind of politics than the other papers, but they were just as committed to an elite form of politics as the other guys, and they are mostly guys. Um, and so they they uh, came out with a position that would support the federal liberal party and the provincial liberal party, whom they were supporting with their editorial line. Uh, and they sick their attack dogs. I mean, it was very interesting to look at the media treatment of the BC Citizens Assembly and the Ontario Citizens Assembly. In BC, in 2005, the media had a kind of love-in with the Citizens Assembly. Uh, but then that helped the public to see the Citizens Assembly as something positive. And that contributed to the 57, 58% of the popular vote that they got. In Ontario, they weren't going to make that mistake. And so they came out fighting right from the beginning, challenging the credibility of the CA, challenging the individuals involved. Who are these people? Who gave them the right to make this decision? Why should we trust them? I mean, that was the kind of coverage uh, that it was getting. Um, and in a sense, it had its intended effect. Um, people didn't really understand what it was or just thought it was you know, politics. People who paid more attention saw that there was something interesting going on. So I just want to comment a little bit on the star too, about how they've, I'm sure everybody saw about two years ago that they came out with an op-ed saying that this, this is just provincially for Ontario, mind you, right? But we now support proportional representation. And we think that the 2007 uh, editorial board was wrong in opposing proportional representation. Of course, you'll notice now we have a Doug Ford government, right? And people pointed that out right away, right? I could have changed. Um, but I mean, in terms of, you know, looking forward on the federal issue, if the polls are correct, you know, we could end up seeing um, a more formally established support from that news outlet, which would be actually really nice to see a silver lining, I suppose. Okay. I think that we've covered pretty much everything that we're going to cover. We've been here almost an hour and a half. Dennis has answered so many questions. I know that there are so many more questions. The What I want everybody to take away, and I know that the presentation probably seemed like quite a while ago now, but on those slides, which I'm sure he'd be happy to share with you, he gave us a lot of reasons to hope, which is about you know, just to sum up, you know, when you see shifts in the party system, more parties having more power, more minority governments, instability in the party system, um, you know, coinciding with the buildup of our activist movement from a couple people at a kitchen table talking about something nobody even could even identify, like define 25 years ago to, you know, where we've come now, where we had so many people knocking on doors for us. In December, in January, our movement has come a long way in terms of the number of people, in terms of the, the expertise we have, in terms of the lessons we've learned, in terms of the skills that we have. We have a long way to go, but we've come a long way too. And, you know, like Dennis said, this movement is really about being ready for that moment uh, when we can help make change happen. We have to keep growing so that we're ready to, to push that change through the door when that moment opens and it, and it will open for us. Okay, so and, I want to thank everybody. Yes, Dennis. I can, I can just throw in a few final words, uh, Anita, I and mean, that's a great, great wrap up. Um, 
You know, when we started Fair Vote Canada, and I didn't, I, I, I was there at the beginning, but I wasn't one of the founders. I was just, I set myself aside. I said, look, let me be your, you know, geek, um, and uh, you, you, you guys be the public face. Um, when we started, I think a lot of people thought that Fair Vote was going to march out and educate everybody directly, and we were going to lead this, you know, march of, of, of millions of people to reclaim their democracy. Um, and I think we've come to realize that we have a more strategic role to play. Our role is to open up the space for the discussion. Our role is to create the space so that politicians can say, well, you know, there's a lot of really great work out there. And uh, well, as Fair Vote Canada says, like we, we create the space to let them come to our positions. You know, politicians need to be able to justify taking different positions and not just politicians, opinion leaders, uh, different people who have influence. The more that we can connect what we're doing uh, to the public and what the public wants to see, the more persuasive we we become. And that is due to the work that all of you are doing, right? That door to door work, the, the, the endless, you know, appearances at the Pride Parade. All of that is really important. And, and so I, you know, I just got to thank you all, you know, for what you're doing, because the more that we can connect with people, um, it, it's, it's another way of, of being ready, because when the moment comes and there are enough people who know where to go to get information, then people are going to turn to them and say, what is this issue? Why are people talking about it? So to the extent that we're visible and you're visible, you become a point of contact. You become someone who can be an ambassador uh, for our issue. So thank you for your efforts. Uh, we, we can't do it without you. Um, and let's keep let's keep going forward. I think there's lots of reasons for hope. Thank you, Dennis. And thank you everyone who joined us tonight. And hopefully we'll see you again. Okay, good night, everyone. <laughs>